Welcome back to Investment 360. Now, despite being four years into her tenure, that has seen APSA acquire Barclays Africa operations and then rebrand itself as Barclays Group Africa. Questions have been asked as to whether Maria Ramos is still the right person to lead the company. So what do investors think? Singer Kungisa joins us to share his thoughts. Well, nothing like putting you in the hot seat and putting the <laughs> toughest question to you before we get any further. All right. Um, I think Maria Ramos has uh, obviously been the least experienced CEO within the banking space in South Africa. And also the fact that she comes from a non-bank environment doesn't play to her favor. But you know, within the four years that she's been at APSA, she's been able to bet two big deals that other bank CEOs haven't been able to do. So that counts to her favor, you know? And uh, I mean, she has been able to to, to clinch the deal at Adcon, which is quite a big book that other banks also were bidding for. And she has also been able to do the acquisition in Africa of eight operations. That so is, you are a Maria Ramos fan? Well, um, to be fair on her, to be fair on her, I think um, she, when she joined APSA, she had to deal with the uh, single stock futures, pinnacle point shares, debacle. You know, she had to sort that out, which is still an ongoing battle. And also, she had to sort out the loose mortgage book that uh, the previous management wasn't taking care of quite well. So I think she's done pretty okay. Singer, just coming to that, uh, we saw, I think, in the early part of her tenure, a lot of senior people leaving ABSA. Obviously, Louis von Ziena left a little bit later, but uh, the, the sort of criticism at the time was that, uh, you know, as you say, she, she, she wasn't very big on banking experience, although she does have a wide, a very wide range of experience in National Treasury and then at Transnet. But the argument was that when you have senior people, a group of senior people leaving the organization, they're always going to be a little bit diluted and a little bit lightweight uh, in terms of their experience. A, a criticism she did refute. But do, do you think that's kind of played into this narrative that we have now about people kind of saying, well, is she kind of right for the job? She's, she's, done, she's done some good things, but she hasn't really kicked the business forward in the way I think many people would have hoped. Yes, I agree. She hasn't really kicked it the way people have liked. But, uh, and also um, the fact that, you know, when you lose the, the executives, then you're losing the engine of, of the operation, you know, which is not to her favor. But um, looking at things now, I think she's correcting that. And I think things are starting to sort of work for the Barclays Group. And uh, the performance of, of Barclays Africa Group uh, recently has been quite good. They've been outperformed by the other banks. But now um, I think they've got an opportunity to rebrand themselves and, and bring back their glory days. Let's chat about the, the other banks in relation to, to Barclays Africa. Standard Bank obviously has always had a stranglehold on the African continent, so to speak. Do you believe that they can retain their first move advantage or are they slowly losing it? I don't think they're losing it just yet. Um, they still have the largest operations in Africa and under the leadership of Peter Slebish, who is the star within the retail banking, I think they're quite strong on that front. You know, and um, also they've got huge assets, um, huge capital. They they have an opportunity to really expand and, and become the African bank that they are. They pride themselves to be. Seeing it almost seems to me that it's it's kind of the the narrative around Africa is a little bit overblown because at, at the moment it only contributes about ten percent to. Uh, operating profits if I'm not mistaken. So while the focus after they had that worldwide ambition to, to be an emerging market bank has come back in and become a lot more focused around Africa, the actual money flowing from those operations yet is, is, is not as big as it's kind of like the hype has made it out to be. Anything in it for the South African operations in terms of trying to catch up with, with the uh, re very retail friendly model that FNB have been uh, offering as well as the competition coming from the likes of Capitec? Um, FNB. Well, FNB has got a strong uh, retail presence in South Africa, and as well as other business portfolios that they have. I mean, we've saw, we've seen good growth, steady growth, which is less volatile coming from the West Bank division, and also they've shown that they're leading the digital space within their retail banking. And also, they've got quite a strong brand within RMB. So locally. 
FNB is quite strong. And uh, in Africa, they, they're not necessarily too keen on um, buying earnings because they believe that um, the, the, those earnings are quite expensive for them. So they'd rather draw organically. But on, on, on Standard Bank, they have been investing, hence we've seen low return on equity. But going forward from now, I think they will start to draw at double-digit margins, you know, because um, their, their Stanbic franchises have recorded headline earnings per share of over 60% this year to date, you know. So things are slowly turning for the South African banks, you know. But we must always remember, Africa is not a short-term play. It's a long-term play, you know, so... It's also not I, for sissies. Africa exactly, is not for sissies. Exactly. You know, you will, you, will, you will pay the school fees at some point or the other. The increased, I think the increased, uh, Bruno, I just wanted to ask, the increased capital uh, that the banks now have to set aside for, for, for different types of risky assets, uh, the, the way, you know, you kind of look at the different uh, markets that the banks operate in, vehicle finance, credit cards, short-term loans, obviously the, the big one has been housing and that's uh, mortgage loans, which has been very quiet over the last few years. But I mean, do you think there's going to be a real kicker there for South African banks as that credit cycle st starts to take off in the future? Um, yes, they would if, if obviously the economic fundamentals do change in South Africa, which is the mortgage space, the mortgage space is quite hinging on strongly. So in the short term, I doubt, I mean, we need uh, a growth of about 5% in South Africa GDP to be able to see that kick. So that would take, um, I don't know, about two, maybe, no, not two, maybe four, five years to come. Nedbank. Yeah. And the JV model that they operate with EcoBank, which has obviously got traction on the continent. We've seen little negative news flow out of that territory, EcoBank specifically of late. Do you think that the NetBank model and the way that they approach Africa is a good one? Um, for them, it's a good one. They don't want to overexpose themselves. They, they, I think they, they're trying to learn from other banks who've gone into Africa first. They're quite conservative in their model, of which I think it's good for them, you know. And the exposure in EcoBank will definitely do pay off. And the way they've been going about Africa, they're trying to draw organically, which is the way I think they, they've also gotten out, of the, out of, of, the, of the red in South Africa as well. Because you must remember, NetBank has been sort of referred as an underdog sort of bank within the big fours. But you know they've come to the fore and they've proven themselves. You think Old Mutual is going to keep them in the stable? I think so. I think so. I mean, all, all Net Bank has contributed about 48% to the, to, the, to the old mutual group's earnings last year. So they're doing quite well. They, they have no reason not to keep them. Singer, the, uh, the, the th Net Bank's probably been the best performing bank over the last few years in terms of uh, its share price. And I think they've just kind of kept a fairly steady ship going straight forward without making too many big mistakes. What's a, it, it looks like you know, South African banks, the big four, have only one route to really grow, considering that South Africa's local economic conditions are not looking very good, and that's the go into Africa. Is there, is there any other way that you see that these banks can actually grow earnings uh, besides from that? Um, look, South African market is, is, is mature, yes, I agree, but it's not saturated as yet. They have an opportunity to, to build their product choice, their um, value proposition to their clients. So I think they still have scope to draw within, Afri within South Africa, you know. And um, also with regards to NetBank, I mean, they've, they've done incredibly well over the last few years. I mean, they've added, last year already, they added 655,000 customers to their That's books. no mean feat. I mean, that's you a know, big number. That's a big number, of course, you know, and they've rolled out branches, about 80 to 90 branches across South Africa. They've rolled out 500 ATMs. Uh, so they, they're doing quite a lot of things that is improving their margins within South Africa. So I think they still have the scope. And uh, I mean, with their, uh, with their campaigns that they've launched, um, the Savy campaign, the Kiona, you know, it's attracting market share from other banks into net banks. So there is, there, is, there is stiff competition in South Africa and there is obviously growth for opportunity. But also, it's always important to know that it's also hinging on a lot of things, like the, the fears around um, unsecured lending or also the economy as a whole.
I mean, that's certainly been, uh, I think that it looks to me like the strategy has been with the retail space is to try and win over the client account. The client uses their transactional banking account and then you can sell them anything from unsecured lending to insurance policies, et cetera, et cetera. The, the biggest fight's obviously been trying to get those accounts and that's where the likes of Capitech uh, have been very good at. They were also one of the first ones to move into the unsecured lending, which I guess the big four kind of trailed them there. Do you think they, they're really taking cognizance of what uh, Capitech's doing and what Capitech's model is, more importantly? I think so. I don't think they're underestimating them, but um, I remember listening to a Mike Brown interview saying that, uh, well, it, the, the argument was, um, are you fearing that Capitech is taking over NetBank as the, as the fourth largest bank? He reckoned no, because their asset size, their capability is much more bigger than Capitech. So I don't think that they do take on sense of that, but at this stage, I don't think they are worried. I mean, even with the, even with the number of accounts that uh, Capitech have uh, managed to win, and I mean, they, they do operate, uh, I think I heard, uh, I think it was Peter Schlebusch from Standard Bank saying it's, it's very easy to come into a market and use technology as a new competitor because you don't have any of the legacy systems and problems that the big four have. Obviously, they've also got the bricks and mortar uh, around those operations. But uh, I mean, certainly that the Capitech and, and now with the African Bank launching what looks to be a, a full service bank offering as well, uh, it seems that the competition is going to get even more intense. It will definitely do get intense. But um, also, you, you must remember, people sometimes uh, do get reluctant to change um, their banking, um, their banks, who has been servicing them for, for quite some time, especially if they've done big transactions with them, like a vehicle financing or, or mortgage financing. So I think there's still a long way to go for Capitec and African Bank to really compete in all the different divisions of a fully functioning bank. That was Singa Gungkisa, who's an independent analyst. And that's it for Investment360 this evening. Thanks to my co-host, Warren Dick.